we talk about icons and what is it to be an iconic figure. And um, the next speaker we have is a soon to be professor of African American studies graduate from UC Berkeley. He's a popular teacher, activist on his campus and everything. Um, I'm proud to say that, you know, I knew him when he was 12 years old, so I know I'm getting old when, you know, they're catching up to me and everything. But um, he's going to talk about Malcolm and the concept of iconic imagery from the past to the future. His name is Brother Amir Hassan. Talk to here. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, as you can see, I am evoking the iconic, the iconic imagery of Malcolm. Right? It's the glasses. It's the slim fit, the slim tie. The the bit like, like I was telling the brother earlier. Before I knew what Sunna, like, oh, this is a Sunna beard. I was like, that's a Malcolm beard, right? <laughs> So as an African American, I associated like my aesthetic with Malcolm, right? As an aesthetic of respect, right? As, a, as an aesthetic of seriousness or, or to be taken seriously, right? I was just telling one of my students, he was like, oh man, you think you Malcolm X or something? And he was basing that on my look, right? And I said, well, so who are you supposed to be? Who are you representing, right? With your pants sagging, your long chain, tats everywhere. Like, who, who are you? Who are you representing? Who are you trying to say, this is who I am before, you, before I even open my mouth? Right? So, but when we're dealing with iconic figures, right? So, it says that the icon has been defined as a visual explanation of a larger symbolic order of time and space, but without the knowledge of an icon's underpinnings, a viewer cannot unlock its function. Right? So we can see something, right? Even when we just showed this thing, right? The one thing I found interesting is that all of these iconic imageries of Malcolm, only one of them took Shahada, and that was his grandson. So the, sp the iconic Malcolm as a visual representation, devoid of the spirituality, can go anywhere, right? This, this is emblematic of the flattening of an icon, right? So one of the things we're looking at in Malcolm on display as the uniqueness of his iconic self, right? Because it's almost like if we're speaking in theological terms, we're talking about a trinity of Malcolm, right? There's the, there's the, the thug Malcolm, there's the nation Malcolm, and there's the Shahada Malcolm, right? right? This is the trinity of Malcolm, right? As we, choose, and, and as we choose to employ the iconic self of Malcolm. So there becomes moments where we always bring up the thug, like this brother brought up, right? The, the, the potential of becoming something better is always tethered to this potential, I mean, the, the, the past Malcolm as a criminal, as Detroit Red, right? We, we always evoke that Malcolm to prove a larger point, right? And then we go to the nation, of, the nation of Islam Malcolm, or the black nationalist Malcolm, and we start to get to another point, right? We start to, we, we bring up that iconic Malcolm at that point, right? And then we might get to something else when we're talking about a diasporic Malcolm, a, 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 a Shahada Malcolm, an Islamic Malcolm, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, and the, the full potential of this person, right? And these are all ways we evoke the iconic Malcolm, right? But, and I didn't really think about this until, really, until I met his daughter. It's a selfish, right? There, there's two forms of iconicizing Malcolm in my eyes, right? There's a benevolent, benevolent, iconic evoking of Malcolm. Like what we're doing today, we're evoking these iconic symbols of Malcolm. Malcolm, the political prisoner. I mean, the, 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 the person evoking a political spirit. Malcolm, the Muslim. Malcolm, this. Malcolm. These are all Malcolm that we benevolently are selfishly evoking, almost like at a funeral, right? You know, you're at a funeral, or at least I notice at black funerals, right? Somebody dies, and everybody's crying to jump in the casket, and you want to show, you're selfish. The person's past and going to a better place. You selfishly, even though it's out of love, you selfishly want them to stay. But they got to go, right? It's benevolent, but it's still selfish. 
right? And in our own ways, and I, I include it, right? We selfishly, in a benevolent way, evoke Malcolm for our own purposes, right? For our purposes, for our missions, right? I'm associating this with Malcolm because therefore it gives me a certain validity in a certain space, right? But again, I'm arguing that this is a flattening of him because oftentimes, like I said, in talking to his daughter, the, one of the, I mean, all the books I've read and articles and lectures and all the stuff that I went through as an academic, not just a lover of Malcolm, but an academic of Malcolm, right? The one thing she said was she talked about him as a father. And she was talking about how he was, he was like, she, he was the nice one. My mother, that was the one who was, who was the disciplinarian. My dad was real nice and smiling and all. And then I started to think like, well, how often do we talk about Malcolm the brother? Like brother, like real brother Malcolm, not political Malcolm, right? And this is where we're flattening the iconic self of Malcolm. Malcolm is a three-dimensional figure, but we flatten him to fit our intentions, our purposes, our goals, to, to tether him to our movements, right? But we're not talking about, man, Malcolm used to carry his kid on his shoulder. We don't talk about that father. We don't talk about Malcolm the friend, right? And all I'm saying, and what I'm saying in this moment is that when you disconnect Malcolm from this, you're flattening him, right? You're flattening not just the potential of Malcolm, but the existence of Malcolm, right? You're flattening what he is in totality, not as an iconic symbol, but as a human being. And it seems like, and, and there is reverence, right, in iconicizing someone, right? Because you're paying them respect. But at the same time, you are picking what parts you want to respect and what parts you want to take out to fit your agenda. And again, a benevolent agenda, <laughs> albeit, right? But there is also the evoking of, like, there's this, right? This, I mean, you see everybody with this, right? This is the move, right? Boom, I got the ring on. I, I, I searched far and wide to find that ring, right? I was like, I got to find that ring, right? I got to find some of them glasses. Trust me, I can damn near read something off that wall without these glasses on. I read very, I, I see very well, abnormally well, actually. I don't care. Malcolm wore these glasses, right? I was wearing glasses like this in the eighth grade when it was time to talk. It was like, oh, it's time for something serious? Putting on my Malcolm glasses, right? This is evoking that iconic self. But when we think about one of the most iconic images of Malcolm, we think about Malcolm standing by the window with the rifle, right? You have BDP evoking that, right? As a, as a black militant stance, like I will protect myself by any means necessary, right? Okay. You have Nicki Minaj recently taking that image, that same image, and depoliticizing it to use as artwork for her song, Looking Ass Nigga, right? Again, same image, different message, right? A terrible message, and I'm proud to say that black folks actually stood up and wouldn't let that pop off. They actually, to use colloquial term, they rode on her for it, and she had to apologize publicly. She had to be humbled for that, right? But these are two tetherings to it. One is, again, there's a hostile, there's a hostile iconic self with the Nicki Minaj and it's benevolent with KRS-One. But then, why was he really, why was he standing by the window with a gun? Who was he protecting? His family. That's not the, when, when KRS is standing by the window with the gun, as much as I love that album cover and it is iconic for hip, hip hop imagery, he is not talking about, I'm standing by the window protecting my children, my family. When Nicki Minaj bring it up with Malcolm standing by the window, she's talking about that first Malcolm within that trinity, the, the hustler. KRS is talking about that other Malcolm, the black nationalist. I'm talking about the father. This this is the Malcolm we very rarely like talk about. And maybe it's because we don't know that much about it, right? But when we're talking about iconicizing and flattening, I'm saying that at some point we have to not look at 
this, which is a flat surface, the flat surface of Malcolm, but we have to look at him and spin him around, right? And see, it's like, wow, he's an actual whole being. The vulnerability of Malcolm, right? Because when you, when you de-iconicize Malcolm, now you start to humanize Malcolm. So when we're looking at, so we can also look at, let me see. We can also look at this from this perspective, right? When we walk out of here, and like I said, like even looking over, I see his daughter, right? And that always throws me off a little bit, right? <laughs> it throws me off, right? And then I have to remind myself, like, why? Why does that throw me off? Is it because I'm, I'm partially flattening Malcolm myself to not see him as human? Like, in putting him on that pedestal, we're almost taking away his humanity. I have to, and we all should see the humanity of Malcolm, right? Not the humanity tethered to some political movement, not the humanity tethered to iconic imagery, but the humanity tethered to Malcolm as an everyday human being that by any means necessary was willing to stand there and protect his family. I've, I've yet to hear or see anybody, you know, actually bring up or evoke Malcolm the father in association with that image. And I think one of the things we should walk out of here as people, as humans, is to remember that those images, the images of Malcolm that, that we have iconicized, that what Malcolm represents, by evoking them like when we have T.I., you got T.I., you got Wale, right? They're using Malcolm to sell, they're using Malcolm to sell things. So in the same way that Professor or Dr. Algar talks about we should not be so readily willing to attach Malcolm to a holiday because attaching Malcolm to the holiday is the, the antithesis of what Malcolm represented, particularly in attaching him to a U.S. holiday. We should also feel the same way about marketing Malcolm as a thing to sell products that supports the capitalist structure of America. Right? So when you see Wale, and we like, damn, that's dope, Wale doing the Malcolm X thing. No, he's promoting tattoos. Right? When you see T.I. on the cover promoting the Malcolm X thing, no, that's him provoking the Malcolm that had guns because T.I. had just got off for having guns. Right? And seeing as being rebellious. Right? But all of these evocations of Malcolm are devoid of the spirituality of Malcolm, of the humanity of Malcolm. They're using them to true, prove points. I saw the, the, the sister with the Malcolm look. It's almost like, sisters can be Malcolm too. Okay, that's good too, right? We all want to use Malcolm for something. But at some point, when do we recognize Malcolm for him in totality, right? Devoid of the iconic Malcolm. I shouldn't, although I should, right? I should be able to put this on and people say, brother, you look like Malcolm. I put this on not to look like Malcolm, but I want to be like Malcolm, right? But then I have to ask myself, and I, like I said, this all became very complicated once I met his daughter. I was like, well, she, she knows that that was her dad. You know what I'm saying? That's different. Like, I know stuff of Malcolm that I've read, that other people have reported, that, I've, that people have utilized to sell books. Again, even in the academic space, this is about selling books. This is about getting published. This is about doing speaking engagements, as to your CV, which gives you the ability to have tenureship. Right? People are using Malcolm in that way. And when we, when we, when we have these conferences I, or these conversations, I think that it is important to get past not the, the iconography of Malcolm, but to see him as a human being, a full human being, and to actually want to find those nuggets of Malcolm that we didn't already know, that don't make us feel good about our, our stance in society, but also to push us further in our personal lives. Because I'm telling you, when she said that to me, it made me, because I, I associated my parental style with the iconic Malcolm and, hey, be, you know, that, that, that Malcolm that we see in sound bites, the performance of Malcolm. When she said that I was different than my son from that day forward, because I looked up to him. I don't get to pick and choose what part of him I wanted to look up to. That part was more influential to me than all of the other stuff, all these glasses and hats and ties and clips. 
That part was important to me. It made me become a kinder father. And I thought I was doing the right thing. Right? I was being a disciplinarian. I was disciplining my child. And I was like, because this is this what I imagined Malcolm would do. Because I watched the performance. I bought into the iconography of Malcolm by people who are oftentimes capitalizing and cashing in on Malcolm. Ain't nobody giving them no money for them t-shirts they selling in the movies they make. This is a cash in. I love the, I, I, I learned how to say Al Fatih by watching the, the, the um, X, right? I, re, I recorded it and I put it on the tape and I used to rewind it. That's how I learned. I used to listen to it every day like it was, like it was in my headphones. Now I'd be walking out and I rewind it. That's all, that, you know, we used to rewind things. <laughs> right? And I'm not even old, but we used to rewind things and play them back and you got lucky if you caught that spot again. You start to remember how, what the tape looked like, so you know exactly where to go. But at the same time, th that is a Malcolm associated and, and being capitalized in a particular way. That is a, a Malcolm that, like I said, in most of these evocations of Malcolm, they are also devoid of the spirituality of Malcolm and the person of Malcolm. They're tethered to something else. They're tethered to some other agenda, whether it be benevolent or hostile. So, in parting, I just want to say that um, we should walk out of here feeling better about our understanding of Malcolm, right? Not just the Malcolm, but like, like I said, not, and let's not try to find the Malcolm that we can go read in a book, right? And I think we all, this brother, Hashem, Ansar with his slides, all of us, right? We all have something to contribute, but, but and I say this, and, I, and, and, and again, I go looking at her. When his daughter comes up here and speaks, please listen. That's a Malcolm you don't know from a source that you, that like, this is not something that we can footnote and cite. Like, I, like, like this brother talks about, the footnoting. And this is his child that touched him and held him in ways that none of us will ever be able to experience. Ever. And add that, and I, and I say in closing, just add that to your iconic representation and understanding of Malcolm. Outside of this, the, the televisual sphere or the, 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 the journals, the articles, the autobiography of Malcolm X, the evocations up in these other spaces, add that Malcolm that you didn't know, the father Malcolm, the regular person Malcolm. Start to wonder about that smile of Malcolm. Right? These other things, that the smile will come out at times, but you probably didn't think he should have been smiling. Like, let's start to really embrace the person of Malcolm and, and not just utilize and employ the iconography of Malcolm. That's it. All right. So I'm like... <laughs>